This is the lecture for Sartre's Existentialism is a Humanism. Like the de Beauvoir lecture, you don't have to watch this ever. You don't have to watch this before you do the reading. This is an optional lecture. I'm just going to talk about some stuff uh, in the reading. This also is not going to talk about anything in the first reading assignment. This is all stuff that shows up in the second reading assignment. So, great. Um, and basically, I'm going to talk about three objections that people make to the existentialists and what Sartre's response to them are. So all of these objections stem from the sort of central worry, which is that existentialism is just entirely subjective uh, because everything depends on us, because morality depends entirely on us, uh, sort of there's something wrong here. And so he talks about sort of three versions of this criticism. So he says the most common instance is when people tell us, so you can do whatever you'd like. So this is objection number one. Ethics is subjective, so I can just do whatever I want. Another way of putting it is they tax us with anarchy, then they say you cannot judge others, for there is no reason to prefer one project to another. So the thought is, look, everything's subjective, so nobody's choices are better than anybody else's choices. Everybody's choices are equal. How can you judge somebody else? Finally, they say, since all your choices are arbitrary, you receive into one hand what you grant with the other. So the thought is, uh, on the one hand, you're saying existentialism gives us a source of an ethical theory, which is, as I've talked about before, basically Kantian. So on the one hand, you're giving us this ethical theory, but with the same hand, you're taking it away because you're saying it's entirely subjective, so it doesn't matter at all. So on the one hand, you give us this nice ethical theory based on freedom, but then because we're ultimately free, it, you, you just take it right back. It doesn't matter. So let's look at what Sartre has to say about these objections. So objection number one, ethics is subjective, so you can do whatever you'd like. The first objection, that you can choose whatever you'd like, is simply incorrect. In one sense, choice is possible. What is impossible is not to choose. I can always choose, but I must also realize that if I decide not to choose, that still constitutes a choice. So his first point is, look, uh, no, you can't do whatever you'd like. If you would like not to choose, that's off the table because you can't avoid a choice. So there's one thing that you can't do, which is not to choose, because not to choose is to choose. So technically speaking, you can't do whatever you'd like. So this is just obviously false. And he says, look, this may seem a purely technical difference. So you might say, okay, technically I have to choose. I agree. But like, <laughs> what does that mean? But it's very important since it, since it limits whim and caprice. Although it is true that in confronting any real situation, for example, that I'm capable of having sexual intercourse with a member of the opposite sex and of having children, I am obliged to choose an attitude towards the situation. And in any case, I bear the responsibility of a choice that in committing myself also commits humanity as a whole. So he says, look, it's not a purely technical point to say you must choose. Because remember what it means to say you have to choose. Your choice has to be a choice that you can sort of justify to humanity as a whole. You have to have a reason for your choice, and it has to be justifiable not just for you in your particular situation, but for everybody in that sort of situation. It's the Kantian sort of picture of morality, which is can you will that everybody act on this maxim that you act on? So the fact that you have to choose comes along with having to choose in the way the existentialist says you have to choose, which is the way Kant says you have to choose, which is you have to consider, well, you know, what if everybody were like me? Is this choice the sort of thing that it's worth humanity doing, not just merely me? Because you are ultimately responsible for the choice. You commit humanity as a whole whenever you make this choice. Even if no a priori value can influence my choice, so even if there's nothing outside of you in charge of your choice, the latter has nothing to do with caprice, so the choice has nothing to do with caprice. So the thought is, look, it's true that there's no outside influences, but merely the fact of it being a free choice that depends on you, that comes along with its own constraints. So this was the sort of the magic of Kant's answer that we saw back when we studied Kant, which is if there's no outside uh, heteronomy that controls you, if you have to be autonomous, if you have to make an autonomous choice, what could possibly govern your choice? Can't you just choose anything? No, what could govern your choice is something that could serve as a law for any free choice. And that is something, a maxim that could be universalized. So he thinks merely having to make a choice uh, 
brings along with it morality, even though it's coming from inside of you, inside of, from, from having to make a choice, uh, not from external circumstances, but entirely your subjectivity. So since man finds himself in a complex social situation in which he's committed, and by his choices commits all of mankind, and he cannot avoid choosing, therefore we get sort of moral restrictions. So he will choose to abstain from sex, or marry without having children, or marry and have children. Whatever he does, he cannot avoid bearing full responsibility for his situation. He must choose without reference to any pre-established values. But it would be unfair to tax him with capriciousness. Rather, let us say that moral choice is like constructing a work of art. So the thought is, look, there are no rules when it comes to painting a painting or doing a sculpture. Nobody can tell you how you're supposed to do it. That's not how art works. It's entirely up to you. But that doesn't mean that any sort of thing you do to the painting, any brush stroke is just as good as any other brush stroke, any hit with the chisel is just as good as any other chisel. The fact that you are creating this painting, the fact that you are in charge of what happens to this painting, it gives you the responsibility for each brush stroke to have some reason to make that brush stroke, to make a good brush stroke, not in some sort of uh, external sense of good. It's not like there's some rules out there that tell you what a good painting is, but you're the one who's coming up with this painting. You have to create a good painting. The good painting can't come from just following a set of rules. It's up to you to make a good painting. And so he goes into this by talking about, like, you don't, we don't want to make a mistake by thinking like morality just is making a good painting. So it's not like literally morality is aesthetic. Uh, this is just an analogy. But what art and morality have in common is creation and invention. We cannot declare, decide a priori what ought to be done. Uh, I believe that blah, blah, blah. Um, whether you follow like some Kantian moral system or whatever, uh, it's up to you to choose that system. The system itself can't decide for you. Uh, you're obliged to invent your own laws, is how he puts it. So man makes himself. He doesn't come into the world fully made. He makes himself by choosing his own morality, and his circumstances are such that he has no option other than to choose a morality. So you have to choose, and this means you can't do whatever you'd like. The fact of being in a certain situation means when you choose, you commit the rest of mankind, and you must choose based on reasons that you think are justified to the rest of mankind. So that's his response to the first objection. Second objection. In the second place, people tell us you cannot judge others. What does he say about this? In one sense, this is true, and in another, not. So, you know, yes and no. It is true in the sense that whenever a man chooses his commitment and his project in a totally sincere and lucid way, it is impossible for him to prefer another. So one way in which you can't judge others is that, look, uh, it, once somebody commits themselves to something, that makes them who they are. And at that point, they can't change who they are. There's nothing, like, if I kill somebody and I'm a murderer, that, that's it. I can't go back. I can't. There's nothing I can do to not be a murderer. So once I commit to a project in a sincere and lucid way, then there's no going back. And so uh, nobody can sort of judge me in the sense of telling me, you know, you should, you should be something else. You shouldn't be a murderer anymore. No, it's too late. It's impossible for me to be something else. And that's true not just for like evil stuff, but for anything. Let's say I'm a fully committed like Christian or communist or something. At some point, you can sort of get yourself stuck into these things so much that uh, you can't see any way out of it. Like there couldn't be a way for you out of it. And so in that sense, nobody can sort of judge you. It's not like they can say you should be making different choices. Like, no, only some things will be possible for you because of what you've committed yourself to. So, okay, fine. It's also true that in a sense, we don't believe in the idea of progress. Progress implies improvement, but man is always the same, confronting a situation that's forever changing, while choice always remains a choice in any situation. The moral dilemma has not changed from the days of the American Civil War, when many were forced to choose between taking sides for or against slavery, to our own time, when one is faced with a choice between the popular Republican movement and the communists. So the thought is, one sense of you cannot judge others uh, is like, oh, look, you can't look at other people or other times 
or other cultures and say they're sort of morally backwards. They haven't sort of progressed as far as us. And the existentialist says, yeah, that kind of judgment is off the table. You can't say one society is sort of morally better than another society. The only thing that changes in society are the circumstances in which the, the situations people confront. But mor morally speaking, the only moral judgment you can make about something is that people have a free choice to make when confronted with whatever the circumstances are. And that choice never changes. There's never progress there. You're always confronted with the choice of what to do. So the, since there's no moral progress, we can't judge in the sense of saying that society is morally better, further along, that society is sort of further back. So that kind of judgment is off the table. Situations change, but morality never changes. Morality is always the same. You always confront whatever situation you're in, and that is your choice. So morality is about making a free choice. So that's always the same. So that's the sense in which it's true, but it's also false. So nevertheless, we can pass judgment. For as I said, we choose in the presence of others, and we choose ourselves in the presence of others. So the fact that we're not like the only person in the entire world, this brings along ways of passing judgment. So how? How, how, how can we judge merely because other people exist? Well, first, we may judge, and this may be a logical rather than a value judgment, that certain choices are based on error and others on truth. So this is pretty straightforward. So if I decide to kill somebody because I think they stole from me, but they didn't actually steal from me, of course we can judge that sort of choice because it's based on an error, not based on truth. So that's a sort of moral judgment. We could say you shouldn't have killed that person. And we can correctly judge that I shouldn't have killed that person because I was just, I was making a mistake. So that's one easy sort of moral judgment. We may also judge a man when we assert he is acting in bad faith. If we define man's situation as one of free choice, in which he has no recourse to excuses or outside aid, then any man who takes refuge behind his passions, any man who fabricates some deterministic theory is operating in bad faith. So another way you can judge people is when they say, oh no, I'm just doing what I most desire to do, or I'm doing what my desires lead me to do, or I'm determined to do what I do, you know, I have no free will, or I must do what I, you know, the situation led me to do it, I had to do it, it wasn't my choice, I wasn't free. No, 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 that's all bad faith. That's all ignoring the central existentialist point, which is that existence precedes essence. There is nothing you are until you act, and your act is your choice. You are free to choose. So anybody who says, no, I had to do this because, like, I, I felt some sort of passion, that's bad faith, and you can judge that. One might object by saying, but why shouldn't he choose bad faith? <laughs> What's the big deal about that? My answer is that I do not pass moral judgment against him, but I call his bad faith an error. Here we cannot avoid making a judgment of truth. Bad faith is obviously a lie, because it's a dissimulation of man's full freedom of commitment. So look, Bad faith, or sorry, freedom is a fact. Freedom is a fact of human existence. You cannot deny it. So when you say, you know, I had to do something, I didn't have a choice, you're not even making a moral error, technically. You're making an error of truth. It's just merely false. It's just as false as me saying that person stole from me, so that's why I killed them. We can judge that earlier, the, the killing, because I was false about a matter of fact, and we can judge somebody who acts on bad faith because they're false about a matter of fact. They, they are free and they think they're not, so they're sort of acting on a false premise. On the same grounds, I would also say that I would, I would say that I am also acting in bad faith if I declare that I am bound to help uphold certain values, because it's a contradiction to embrace those values while at the same time affirming that I am bound by them. Uh, yeah, so the thought is, look, you can't be bound by something in the sense of it being outside of you, the only way you can be bound by something is by freely embracing it, by choosing it. So there's no binding really going on in existentialism. The only thing we're bound by is freedom. So there's no values that you're sort of forced to follow. What's going on when you follow values is that you choose the values. So if there were some sort of bindingness, they wouldn't be your values. They would be imposed on you and they wouldn't really be part of you. So the only way for something to be part of you is for you to freely choose it. That's the only way anything ever happens to a human. We freely choose to make it part of ourselves. If someone were to ask me, what if I want to be in bad faith? I would reply, there's no reason why you should not be, but I declare that you are, 
and that a strictly consistent attitude alone demonstrates good faith. So the thought is, <laughs> look, uh, I can't stop you, like I can't get you not to be in bad faith, but if you were going to be consistent, uh, you would be in good faith. If you wanted to sort of act on the basis of truth, you would be in good faith. And so if this sounds a bit like Kant, who said, uh, look, we are, you, you cannot but act, you cannot but see yourself as free. When you, when you act, you always must see yourself as free, and there's just no choice there. I mean, yeah, it's basically the same idea. If you think you're not free, if you act in bad faith, you're sort of committing an error. And it's, it's just, you don't understand how human beings work. You're mistaking the nature of human existence. So what is more, I am able to bring a moral judgment to bear against the person acting in bad faith. So forget all this rational stuff about a judgment of truth. There's also a moral judgment we can make. When I affirm that freedom under any concrete circumstances can have no other aim than itself, and once a man realizes in his state of abandonment that it is he who imposes values, he can will but one thing. Freedom is the foundation of all values. So by the way, whether or not bad faith is a sort of error about truth, it's a moral error too because freedom has to be the foundation of all values. Freedom has to be the source of all morality. And if you act in bad faith, you deny freedom, and so you do not deny all of morality. So we can make a moral judgment against you. So just like Kant, uh, freedom comes from, or morality comes from freedom. Morality and freedom are the same thing. And so acting immorally is to act as if you're not free, and acting as if you're not free is to act as if you are immoral is to act immorally, because human freedom is the source of all values. But here's where we get the division from Kant. That does not mean that he wills it in the abstract, so willing freedom. It simply means that the ultimate significance of the actions of men of good faith is the quest of freedom in itself. So uh, it's not that freedom in the abstract is really the source of morality, it's that uh, sort of the quest of freedom in itself in actual circumstances is the source of morality. So what does this look like in it concretely? A man who joins a communist or revolutionary group wills certain concrete aims that imply an abstract will to freedom, yet that freedom must always be exercised in a concrete manner. We will freedom for freedom's sake through our individual circumstances, and thus in willing freedom, we discover that it depends entirely on the freedom of others that the freedom of others depends on our own. Uh, so the thought is, what is, why does this freedom matter? Like, why, why do I have to will freedom for everybody? Not for some abstract reason, but because every project you will, every sort of concrete thing you try to do, depends on other people being free, depends on the freedom of others. So you need other people to join you in your communist or revolutionary project in order for it to succeed. So when you will communism, or when you will the revolution, you must will the choices of others, too. So you sort of have to universalize in the sense that you have to will that others join you in what's going on in order to sort of rationally commit yourself to anything. You can't rationally commit yourself to communism or some revolution or something unless you rationally commit others as well. As he puts it, you are obliged to will the freedom of others at the same time as you will your own. You can't set your freedom as a goal without also setting the freedom of others as a goal. So when operating on the level of complete authenticity, I've acknowledged that existence precedes essence and that man is a free being who under any circumstances can only ever will freedom. I have at the same time acknowledged that I must will the freedom of others. Kant states that freedom wills itself and the freedom of others. Agreed but he believes that the formal and the universal are adequate to constitute a morality. We, to the contrary, believe that principles are too that are too abstract fail to define action. So the thought is, you know, Kant is correct, but far too limited. Kant is correct about freedom and the fact that freedom wills the freedom of others, but what you need is a sort of concrete version of that in your life. So you can't just will freedom in the abstract and freedom for others in the abstract. You need to will some version of that. So, you know, communism or revolution or it, there's, there's a million ways to live. But so Kant is kind of empty. Uh, we can't get anything out of Kant just from freedom on its own. What we need is some sort of life that we're living in freedom and with other free people. That's the only basis for any kind of system to live ads.
some sort of moral system. So we're sort of Kantians up until the specificity part, at which point Sartre breaks from Kant or maybe develops past Kant and says, look, Kant is all well and good, but we need to go further and sort of add some sort of content into this by taking on particular projects in our life. And it's only by actually acting in the world, by actually making decisions and joining with others and things like this, that we actually get any content to this sort of empty and therefore useless Kantian morality. So that's the response. There's no reason to do one thing rather than another. His response is, well, or sorry, there, there, that's the response to uh, you can't judge people. And the answer is, well, in some sense, that's true, but also we can, we can judge people. You know, there is a basis for morality. Third objection. You receive into one hand what you grant with others. And that means at bottom, our values need not be taken very seriously since we choose them ourselves. So why should I care about your existentialist morality? You're just making it up yourself. In response, I can say that I very much regret it should be so. But if I have eliminated God, the Father, there must be someone to invent values. Things must be accepted as they are. What is more, to say that we invent values means neither more nor less than this. Life has no meaning a priori. Life itself is nothing until it's lived. It is we who give it meaning, and value is nothing more than the meaning we give it. So, yep, like, it's, a, you know, this is too bad. Like, it's too bad there's not something else above us that sort of gives us meaning, that sort of decides for ourselves, what or decides for us what our life is going to be. But, you know, some somebody has to do it. Nobody's going to do it for us, and it's got to be us. So, uh, you know, it's possible to create a human community. So it's not like we have, it's not like there's nothing we can do. It's not like we have to sort of just live with like amorality and just people killing each other left and right. Like you don't have to do that. You don't have to do anything. In fact, that's the point of the existentialist view. Nothing is set in stone. It's up to us. So look, you know, what kind of life do you want to live? What kind of uh, community do you want to live in? So is there, are there any rules? No. But uh, that's, that's life. <laughs>